At uh, 836, we welcome in our next guest. He is the Attorney General of the state of West Virginia and many say the next governor, Patrick Morrissey. Good morning, Patrick. How are you? I am doing well, Rob. It's good to be with all you gentlemen this morning. It's good to have you, sir. I wish you were here in studio. You could be the first one to taste one of these delicious Italian wedding cookies made with love and care by Delegate John Hardy. I am sure they're excellent, and uh, I would love to come by. We'll have to do that. I missed you guys during the fair and the breakfast, uh, the War Memorial breakfast a while back, but we'll we'll keep coming back. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to uh, really romp around Jefferson and Berkeley and Morgan the final few weeks before the election. Did you wait some tables at the Labor Day breakfast? You know, I did. In fact, uh, I told the story of how I uh, waited tables when I was trying to make ends meet when I first started my law firm and nearly went bankrupt. But uh, I picked up a job waiting tables and used to try to pick up as many as I could uh-huh. in order to uh, pay the bills. And I'll tell you, that was a pretty amazing experience because it, it really helped ensure that I wouldn't go under and uh, I think it, it made a big difference. It just t- teaches you what it means to live uh, paycheck to paycheck, and I certainly have had those experiences uh, in my life. The park has some tennis courts. Uh, did you have any flashbacks to maybe jumping up on the high chair and repping a few <laughs> matches, Patrick? Well, you know, better than that, I'd like to get out and play again. I used to play a lot, play tennis in college, and used to teach tennis, and as you uh, uh, point out, I was a professional tennis umpire uh, back in a long, long time ago. And that was actually the way that I was able to see the country, a part of it at least, for the first time. I know growing up, I spent uh, time in just a couple states, and we just didn't have money uh, to travel for vacations. I mean, vacation might be going about 20 miles down the road to the lake, which was great, by the way, but that was a little bit different than crisscrossing the country. So uh, I remember when I had the chance to travel on the men's tennis circuit, I was able to get up to Boston for the first time and make it out to Indiana and Illinois and uh, Philadelphia and many other places. And it was quite an experience. So I feel very fortunate. Uh, But grueling work, too. They put you to work. You'd start at about uh, 7.30 or 8 in the morning and be doing these night matches till about 11.30. It was definitely hard on the eyes. Well, did you have to deal with any John McEnroe like temper tantrums? Yes. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, I had to deal a lot with folks like McEnroe and Connors and Lendl. And uh, I will take the moment to take a, a funny story. So there was a guy back in the day. He was uh, from South Africa. His name was Johan Creek. And he was a really uh, very strong player. I think he rose to five or six in the world. And uh, I remember being up at a tournament in Stratton Mountain, Vermont, and I was on the uh, service line at the time, and there were a couple controversial calls. And I remember at one point, uh, you know, Creek was yelling at me, I mean really going after me. And then there was a ball that came, and he dove, and he struck the ball, and the ball came over and literally struck me on the Adam's apple. Oh and I went down, because if anyone listening knows what it's like to be struck by a and your Adam's apple, you temporarily lose your air. I mean, you just, it's, it's something that you have to almost experience it to know what it's like. And it's just uh, immediately traumatic, not long term damaging. Uh, but I got hit in the Adam's apple and down I went. And uh, everyone in the world's coming over, hey, what's going on? And uh, Yohan Creek comes over and he's all worried, what's going on? And uh, I get taken off the court but I'm fine. And I come back an hour and a half later and I'm on the rotation. The match still going on. Well, there's another ball. That's a close call and Creek is getting ready to yell at me, but he looks at me and he sees that I'm the guy he hits in the Adam apple. And he never said a word. (laughs) That's a good ploy. (laughs) Whenever things get heated, punch yourself in the Adam. I I always say it was good preparation for politics. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of politics, uh, if you don't mind, uh, the governor yesterday said on September 30th he wants to call a special session to consider an additional 5% tax cut, some child care expense uh, issues, and uh, some appropriation of money as well. I saw your comments that uh, while you're not necessarily opposed to these things, you would like more time to be able to put together more detailed legislation in 2025 than trying to cram this through over the weekend. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's 
think so. Uh, the biggest thing is I want to reiterate, I am staunchly supportive of uh, going further on the justice tax cuts. I think that would be very, very positive. And I do think that for West Virginia to compete more effectively with the other states that we touch, we need a lower income tax. In fact, I'd like to eliminate the income tax. So count me in uh, to be very aggressive in moving forward for the next installment uh, immediately. I think that's great. However, you know, look, a lot of the way we have these resources through the federal monies that have come in, I think it's just really critical that uh, we be very aggressive on tax cuts, but you do it really from a perspective of knowing what all the expenditures are going to look like in the next few years and how you can save money, how you can right-size government. Because if you just cut taxes and then you don't take the necessary steps to right-size government and find savings – well, then the next governor is going to be in a very difficult position. So um, I applaud Governor Justice for um, his efforts on the tax cuts and uh, count me in that category. But I do think we need to pay for it. And the best way to do it, we're not going to have a a full effort to audit state government and look at every account in the next few weeks. We are going to have that opportunity uh, when I become governor. Uh, If I'm fortunate enough for the voters to elect me, we're going to go down, we're going to repurpose and re prioritize government the right way to make sure that uh, the very many tax cuts that come ultimately are accompanied with the changes uh, that we need to right-size government. John Gilstrap. So in the right-sizing of government, uh, what, where are the priorities? What's on the block and, and what needs to be pumped up? Well, I, I think I've mentioned on this show and in many others that uh, we want to engage in a backyard brawl with other states that we touch. So I do think that we have to prioritize competing better with the other states that we touch in order to make sure that we're attracting more people. The number one, the number two, the number three goals, workforce participation. And that means driving that workforce participation rate up so we're not last in the nation, we're last. And it's not close. And that has to change immediately. But one of the things you do is you have to say, okay, we have to become more competitive on the tax code to attract more people to come here. You have to look at every regulation that we have in order to make sure that we're competing better. We're a freer economy, and we're attracting more people uh, to West Virginia. You have to look at the workforce rule, the licensing rules. And when you do that, you're going to be in a position to attract a lot more people in. Then, as you do all that and you institute those changes, uh, we have to go forward on education policy. I'd like to make sure that West Virginia's Hope Scholarship School Choice is the broadest in the country. That's going to help attract more people uh, to our state. And then you start to ask the very uh, important questions. What does what's the priority for state government spending? It's going to be 2025 when the next governor takes office. What's the important priority for the state going forward? And you do an audit of every agency. I've actually been calling for this back from when I first took over uh, back in 2013 as AG. I think in the first legislative session, uh, when the Democrats were in control, I asked for audits. No one ever really did it at the length that's needed. I think what you do is you analyze and say, how can we uh, make changes to adopt to the new world? For example, Uh, technology is becoming much more uh, prevalent, the use of AI and various techniques to save resources, whether it's in the benefit eligibility area or in law enforcement. There are a lot of things that could allow us to right-size government, save resources, and think through how much money state government's going to spend, because that's you have to answer those questions. You have to take that to the public in terms of the things that will cost money. How many departments would you want to merge or eliminate the various agencies and the the commissions that are out there? West Virginia has either one or two. We go back and forth, but for a long time, we were number one per capita in state government spending. Think about that. And when we think about that in terms of the number of employees, you have to say, wait a minute, this is not something that we want to continue. We want to change that. And those are the things that you have to look at to make some of the tough decisions uh, for the future so that we're investing in the right things and we can grow our job base. We can become more attractive to 
uh, lure people into West Virginia. Matt Miller. Patrick, when we talk about workforce participation, are we talking about the number of people actually working compared to the number of people within the state? We, we are. And so, for instance, that part of the reason why the West Virginia numbers are lower is because uh, we have a significant percentage of people who are retired, right? We're uh, one of the oldest states in the nation. We have a lot of people who are disabled. Uh, back in the day, some of the statistics showed that West Virginia had the highest disability incident rate in the nation. And so when you combine that, the workforce uh, doesn't have as many people compared to others. And yet uh, what that means is that a smaller and smaller percentage of people are actually paying the bills uh, for everyone. And that's not generally a very um, successful long-term strategy. So we have to think about different ways to bring more people in, you know, to broaden the tax base and to make changes and to be really attractive so that this is the regional destination. And I'll give a couple other examples. When you think of Delaware, a lot of people think of the incorporation policy, right, that it's attractive. Com corporations incorporate in Delaware because they have attractive rules. You think of Silicon Valley uh, for tech companies because they did a lot to – Try to make that more attractive. It was close to Stanford. It was close to a lot of the educational institutions. Well, what does West Virginia want to be known for? And I, for one, look at this and I think there's an opportunity with our energy resources uh, to be able to marry up with some of the technology needs. Technology companies need access to uh, close, affordable, reliable power. And I think that's going to be critical for us to move forward on. So I'm thinking across the board about how we lower more workers and more people and how we eliminate the barriers to live, work, and play in West Virginia or to limit the flow of capital into our state. So, Patrick, when you talk about <clears throat> bringing more people in, is that's the same as incentivizing people to stay, or is, are those different things? Because we do have no, a I, flood I, of people leaving. I think that it's a combination of both, right? You have to make sure that when you're engaging in investments that you're looking out every bit for the local small business that's working, that's struggling, that when you remove the regulatory barriers, when you change the tax code, that it's favorable conditions for people to continue to uh, live, work, and play in West Virginia. So I couldn't agree more. That's why, actually, when I've talked about tax policy, I think the best thing to do is uh, to – make modifications as to how we're trying to build job growth in the state. I think it's better to invest in the basics, the, the core on the tax side, to lower rates for everyone, as opposed to when a lot of these businesses come in, they give you $50, 100000000 million and say, we're going to pay you all this money to come in. But that's five or 10 years down the road, uh, the bill comes due and people are saying, Hey, wait a minute, we need a re-up of that fifty million or hundred million. Supposed to you might take a lot of that money and you might invest it up front in lowering everyone's taxes. So it's just the state is organically more attractive to a lot more people. And then most certainly you might want to keep money available to so that there's some dessert, there's some cream on the top to attract more people in. But let's make sure that the tax changes are spread out across the board. So, look, if you're uh, in Martinsburg and you own a, sh a small business, you own a restaurant, you want to be the beneficiary of those lower taxes, you know, because maybe you want to be able to open up a second business. Or if you're at the garage and you want to, there's some local businesses you want to uh, open nearby because you're creating kind of an eclectic food market, what could be done? Well, if the tax code is more favorable for people to organically open things up, that's how we win. That's how we keep people and ultimately grow a lot of people to engage in small business development here in West Virginia. Attorney General Patrick Morris is our guest here. Did you have a uh, follow up there, John? Well, yeah, I was just going to projecting back a few years when um, my, my son was small and we were making decisions about where to live and where not to live. Education and educational opportunity was certainly at the very top of deciding, yeah, we'll go here versus sure. not going there. And you look at the education numbers in West Virginia, it's no secret, they're, they're not very good. 
Um, so it seems to me sitting here that literacy rates and mathematics rates and all that it kind of is, is the key to everything getting started. Where do you start solving that problem? That's, it's a great question, and there are a lot of programs that are working in different states. I think we need to be uh, focused in several areas on the education front. First, I think to, in order to make the changes that we need the quickest, I do believe that expanding the HOPE scholarship and having broader school choice will help because it's immediately going to give people a chance and a compelling reason to stay or to come to West Virginia. That's critical because we can effectuate change fast. But then there's the related issue on the public school side. It's really important long-term to make those schools more effective, more accountable, and uh, really measure it by metrics. So one thing I'm fond of doing is setting up different metrics uh, in terms of where you rank in various categories and then looking at all of the programs that work, whether it's the phonics programs that have worked, some things that have happened in Mississippi and Ohio to move some of the needles or some of the tools that have been used in STEM, uh, science, technology, education. Uh, I think that there are specific programs that have been proven more effective in certain areas where you're trying to get, gain attainment in reading and writing and arithmetic. I mean, quite frankly, our educational system, uh, so many people have tried to hose it up so much uh, where they're trying to do uh, a lot of these crazy things, whether it was Common Core or um, some of the DEI and other programs that are not effective of actually teaching kids and getting them uh, to a better place and focusing on retaining and attracting the best teachers. At the end of the day, you can have all the standardized systems, and that's critical, by the way. I want to have uh, systems that we can point to objectively are helping us compete with other states, but you also need to make sure that the teachers in West Virginia, wow, they're the folks that you look at and say, um, we're going to be uh, the best in the nation in this area, and this is how we're going to do it. So I think attracting the right teachers is critical. Patrick, I want to move away from what happens as a potential governor to what you're doing now on your job, which is, uh, of course, attorney general. And the question I have for you is regards to uh, a statement you issued after the U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday granted a partial stay of a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision barring enforcement of Arizona's law, which had forced Arizona to allow persons to register to vote in federal races without having to prove U.S. citizenship. Yeah, think about this concept for a minute, what we're arguing about. Uh, I think that you know, you folks know about the problem with illegal aliens coming into our country. And uh, I, for one, think that part of the reason why you're seeing the kind of volume coming in is because the administration has done a terrible job of enforcing our laws at the border. But I think that's a political motive behind it. Uh, there are many people who have been pretty open that they like to see a lot of these folks coming in eventually vote. And so you have a situation where you have people that are certainly not allowed to vote under the law, that there's some people who would like to see them vote because they think it may sway the outcome. And Arizona, the legislature, uh, in their goals said, we're going to make sure that um, if you want to vote in, in Arizona, you're going to have to prove U.S. citizenship. And this is consistent with the voter ID concept that I think uh, I find to be eminently reasonable. Most people do. Um, and it just goes a further step to deal with the fact that um, you should be able to prove your citizenship, especially a lot of these border states. It's been a, it's been a big problem, the number of people coming in. And so we stepped in because this has a national impact. If you're allowed to uh, vote and you're not able to enforce laws in some of these states, we're going to see dilution on the presidential side. And some of these states go with electoral numbers, and you won't really know whether all the people voting are legitimate or not in terms of complying with the law. So we work together with Kansas to submit a brief at the U.S. Supreme Court because it's an important concept. And I certainly want to make sure that that concept's in root in West Virginia as well. Follow-up questions for Patrick before he has to get going. Yeah. Okay, Patrick, there was a couple of other cases as well that I know that you were weighing in on. 
And uh, some of this, uh, some of these cases had to do with uh, Florida child gender procedures and sex reassignment as well. Yeah, I, I'll just talk generally because there's so many cases we're involved in in the space. Uh, for those who don't know, I mean, West Virginia has been standing up for the concept that uh, men and women are different whether that applies to uh, sports or uh, locker rooms or a lot of different areas. Uh, but there have been also a lot of efforts uh, to try to require taxpayers to pay uh, in West Virginia for gender uh, transsexual surgeries and for other things. And so we've been stepping up, uh, obviously, in both West Virginia and across the country because the precedence, if something goes up at the U.S. Supreme Court, there obviously can be a huge impact on West Virginia. And so we've been stepping up and saying, hey, uh, we're joining those efforts the way we ask people to join our efforts uh, to make sure that uh, the laws are upheld and they're not able to kind of blur this transition, this uh, blur the definitions between sex and uh, gender identity, which is really the source of all these of the tension that's out there. This is Past Labor Day, when do you begin to campaign for governor in earnest, Patrick? So I would say we're uh, busy on a few fronts. Uh, we're still working full time in the AG's office. We're putting a lot of uh, effort in. Uh, we spent a lot of time recently dealing with the Purdue Pharma case, that uh, the leftover from the Supreme Court case. That's got to get renegotiated in light of the Supreme Court decision. So that's my priority. I'm going to continue to do that. But obviously, we are getting down to the wire, and I want to make sure that we're um, – hang on one second, guys. My, sure. my dog is uh, going after <laughs> uh, everything chewable in this house. <laughs> uh, see, these are practical problems that they one faces in life. Everyday problems uh, with the dog. Yeah, new puppy, by the way. So oh, we've cool. always had dogs, but now uh, we've got a new one to join the family. you got to send me a but, picture. Yeah, absolutely. No, he's a good boy, but he – there's nothing that he doesn't want to eat, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, so sorry to be distracted, but this, these are the things that happen. Hey, it's okay. Uh, so I would say we're, we're busy across the board. We've been going out last weekend, Friday night. We hit a couple big football games. Uh, we were out at a parade, the Potato Festival in Nicholas County. And then we were uh, out down in Webster County at their county fair. We came back. We were in Clendenin. So we've been campaigning. We're getting out there, and we're going to keep doing that. But my first priority is my job as attorney general. I'm going to keep doing that. You know, but I, I've been trying to get the word out about what we stand for, and I think it's very different from my opponent. He's a very far-left person. I think the contrast between the two candidates is pretty clear. I have about a minute left. Do you have a debate scheduled at all yet? No, we're, we're going to work to put something together, and um, I'm certainly – I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we don't have it on the calendar yet, but I, I do anticipate that there will be a debate. I have one quick question, and that is, will your new puppy take a similar role to Baby Dog if you are elected governor? Well. You know, it's funny you say that. I will say that uh, I, I don't know that I anticipate that. We've had dogs a long time, so this is not a, a political show. Uh, and, in fact, uh, we usually have had two dogs, and one of our uh, girls passed away back in 2018 and so uh this is kind of it's taken a while uh, to kind of get back to the second uh dog and uh i think that uh, we'll, we'll have to see but i will say that i'm not looking to have this as a political show uh these dogs are amazing creatures uh they're so wonderful they add so much to your life and uh i don't want to politicize it i just you know think it's kind of cool to have these unbelievably loyal, smart creatures hanging out with you. Patrick, have a great day. Thank you for your time. Hey, thanks. Take care, guys. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey at 9 o'clock.